assessment uh, and of the invasive tools, we have uh, devices that utilize the pulmonary, pulmonary thermal dilution, uh, PTD, which uh, the only type we have is the uh, Swangans catheter or the PA catheter. Uh, or we have tools that utilize the principle of transpulmonary thermal dilution, uh, like PICO or EV1000, uh, or the other name for it is volume view by Edwards. Or we can use devices like dye dilution uh, devices. And for this, we have only one device uh, which utilizes uh, lithium, and we call it LITCO. Uh, we'll start by the arterial line. Uh, so if you like, it's, it's less invasive or minimally invasive. Uh, this is uh, the best way of assessing the blood pressure because it's more accurate than uh, non-invasive methods. Uh, ideally, it should be inserted into a large artery and large artery produce better signal uh, than peripheral ones. Uh, we have to be mindful of technical issues uh, whenever we are using the A-line. So make sure the leveling is correct. There has been zeroing and the calibration is always done and look at the shape of the waveform and do flush square test. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, flush square test, when you do it, then you get uh, oscillation, one or two oscillations. That's in the normal state. However, if you get too many ringing or too many oscillations, then that you, means your patient, your uh, circulate circuit is under dammed. Or if you don't get oscillation at all, then probably the circuit is over dammed. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much. Ideally, you just flush the tubes uh, and usually deals with the problem. Having said that, as we rely most of the time on MAP in ICU, then the, the over damp or under damp doesn't affect your MAP. So I wouldn't be too alarmed if I find my patient has got uh, damped uh, trace or under damped uh, trace as long as I'm getting a reliable uh, MAP. Uh, the other um, tool that we have, the central venous catheter, as we said, uh, yes, we use it uh, quite often for infusing vasoactive drugs and vesicant uh, drug, drugs. Um, the CVP is quite reliable when it's uh, low. We know that the CVP relies on the venous return and the cardiac function, as we said yesterday. And uh, uh, one way of utilizing the CVP, if we see the CVP is going up, with the dropping cardiac output, then that usually indicates uh, your patients uh, going into right ventricular failure, and ideally you should ask for echo as soon as possible. Uh, perfusion indicators that what you can get, the lactate serial readings would be quite helpful to track the uh, uh, lactate clearance. Uh, you can get the uh, central venous oxygen saturation, uh, and again, that would be a surrogate marker or cardiac output. We'll talk about this in details, inshallah, uh, in our uh, um, last day uh, of this course. And same, we will talk about the CO2 arterial venous cap as another surrogate marker of blood flow in the circulation. Um, pulse contour analysis devices. So we have either the flow track or Vigilio by Edwards. We have the PICO or PICO Rapid. Uh, used to be done by Pulchin. I'm not sure which company now is producing this device. And then we have the Litco Rapid as well, which just gives you uh, analysis of the pulse contour. Um, usually you need the A-line and then you apply this little device or attach it to the A-line. The problem with these systems, they are not calibrated and that will differentiate them from the uh, full version of Pico or the volume review that we will talk about later on. Your patient idea should be in sinus rhythm. They should be passively breathing on controlled mechanical ventilation. Uh, these uh, are less useful when there's significant change in the vascular tone uh, when you are using high doses of presses in the ICU. That makes them really ideal for OR or stable electric, uh, uh, OR uh, with elective cases or uh, patients on low doses of presses in the ICU. This, the set of data that you would get from the pulse control analysis devices, uh, preload indicators, stroke volume and SVV, uh, contractility indicators, as well as the afterload. Uh, moving on to the principles of thermodilution, 
uh, here you have uh, you inject the uh, the the liquid, the cold liquid, if it's thermal dilution, in one end, and you have a sensor uh, at the other end. So here you inject it in the venous uh, circulation. It will go to the uh, right side of the heart. The uh, in the case of the pico, it will go also to the left side, all the way to the uh, one of the femoral arteries where you have the sensor to detect the change in temperature, and this will create this thermal dilution uh, care for you. And from this uh, thermal dilution care, using Stewart Hamilton equation, you can get uh, the different uh, parameters that you need uh, to assess the circulation. So the mean transit time is the time required for 50% of the injectate to reach to the sensor, and then the rest of it uh, will be what we call the decay time or exponential decay time. Uh, and that will uh, indicate uh, the runoff, if you like, or the, um, uh, the vascular uh, resistance. Um, pulmonary catheter uh, or Swangans catheter, uh, it was uh, invented by these two physicians, uh, Gans and Swan, in 1970. And it's basically a balloon tipped catheter, uh, which has uh, uh, where you can inflate the balloon and deflate it uh, once it's inserted uh, in its place. And basically, you insert it at the, either through the femoral vein or subclavian or jugular vein to the right atrium, the right ventricle. Then it will go uh, to the PA pulmonary artery. And here you can inflate the balloon. Once the balloon is inflated, then you are separating this side of the catheter from the forward flow. So the forward flow will reflect the pressure in the left uh, atrium. And if there is no problem with the mitral valve, then you are reflecting also the uh, left ventricle. This is the Stewart uh, Hamilton or modified Stewart Hamilton uh, equation. I really don't need to go into details of this. Uh, it's uh, widely available uh, online and in the uh, textbooks. Uh, the components of the PA catheter, uh, as we said, we have the balloon, the balloon tipped uh, catheter, and then you have various ports, uh, and you have a sensor for the uh, thermostat uh, connector. Uh, you have this for balloon uh, inflation, and this is the picture of the balloon at the tip of the catheter. So as you insert the, the catheter you'll be guided by the waveforms that you are uh, generating. And uh, once you've inserted the uh, catheter past the introducing sheath, uh, then you should inflate the balloon straight away. And the initial trace you will get is the right atrial uh, trace, then the right ventricular trace. And when you get to the pulmonary artery, you'll get the step up in the diastolic pressure to indicate that you are in the PA uh, in the pulmonary artery, and as the tube is inflated, it will wedge itself in the small uh, pulmonary artery, and that, as we said, now reflects the left side uh, of the heart. Now, this is the wedge pressure waveform, more or less similar to the CVP waveform, except that there's slight delay uh, in it compared to the uh, electric uh, uh, cardiac cycle. When do we use the PA catheter? As we said, shock state with ARDS. Whenever right ventricular failure is suspected uh, in pulmonary hypertension cases to guide therapy for increased pulmonary vascular resistance. And nowadays, it's mainly used in post-cardiac and lung uh, surgery, mainly lung transplant uh, surgery. A few practical points. So the contraindications to PA catheter insertion there are absolute contraindication and relative contraindication. Uh, just think of it, you have a balloon uh, uh, tipped catheter. Uh, so if there's stenosis in any of the valves that you're gonna go through them, then that would be a contraindication for the PA catheter insertion. Uh, if you have a mechanical tricuspid or pulmonary valve, then also this is a contraindication. And if there is a thrombus or a mass in the right atrium or the right ventricle, and in the case of tetralogy of power. 
Relative contraindication, people talk about possibility of uh, causing right bundle branch block when you insert the PA catheter. So if your patient has got left bundle branch block, then they might end up having complete heart block. And this will be, or might be significant uh, to your patient. Uh, you need to aim for the correct uh, position of the PA catheter. Uh, and ideally, your patient should be uh, in the dependent part of the lung below the left atrium, which we call West Zone 3. Uh, here we have the uh, pulmonary venous pressure is higher than the alveolar uh, pressure compared to West Zone 1, where uh, if your patient is mechanically ventilated, the alveolar pressure will be high, and that might be compressing the venous uh, the veins, and uh, there might not be uh, a good venous waveform for you to detect. So that's why we always aim for West Zone uh, 3 when we insert the PA uh, catheter. Make sure your patient's PA catheter is in the medial third uh, of the lung. And yesterday, Dr. Uh, Sikter did mention to us that she uh, witnessed a case of PA catheter ending in the pleural space. Just you would wonder, how did they manage to pierce the, the circulation and end up in the, in the, uh, in the plural space. Uh, as we said, on the chest X-ray, you verify that your, uh, the tip of the PA catheter is in the medial third of the lung uh, field. And you should never advance the PA catheter unless the balloon is fully inflated to prevent a complication. As Dr. Sikder mentioned yesterday, then you're, if the PA catheter, if the balloon is inflated, then there is no way it will pierce because it will be a blunt object. It will not pierce the blood vessel uh, at the end of, of, the, of the catheter. Uh, and vice versa, never withdraw the PA catheter without deflating the balloon uh, first, uh, which should not take more than 15 seconds or two respiratory cycles to minimize the risk of infarction or PA rupture. Uh, the witch reading must be taken at the end of expiration, which is the nearest pressure to the atmospheric pressure. Uh, new catheters, you don't even need to inject cold saline, but if you're gonna do that, then uh, cold fluid must be injected fast, as fast as possible. Uh, if you use uh, injected cold saline, uh, then uh, really you should accept readings within 10 percent different from each other and cancel uh, those readings who are out of uh, uh, more than out of range or more than 10 percent difference. Usually we take three readings. Uh, Transcuspid regurgitation will result in underestimation of the cardiac output because as the blood is ejected uh, or you're injecting the cold sign, some of it will come back. And so that you might end up underestimating uh, the cardiac uh, output. Um, this is a uh, the distance or how far do you insert your PA catheter, the catheter is really marked with these lines and rarely you would need to exceed more than 55 centimeters. So again, another safety um, measure for you to avoid, to avoid coiling, knotting, or even ending in the plural space <coughs> as we had uh, yesterday. So, uh, the PA catheter will give you a plethora of data, and again, it will give you indicators for preload, uh, indicators for contractility, and indicators of the afterload, both for the right side of the heart as well as the left side of the heart. Uh, just some uh, historic data, and I need uh, some help with this. If the PA catheter suggests there is low cardiac index less than 2.2, and low wedge pressure, then this situation would mean what? So you have low cardiac output, cardiac index, and low wedge pressure. Any takers? Hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock, well done. So really the treatment would be giving the patient volume uh, loading, excellent. Now you have low cardiac index, and you have high uh, pulmonary artery uh, occlusion pressure or wedge pressure more than 18. So this would indicate? Heart failure. Cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic indeed. And what would you need is really inotropy to support the heart and hopefully that will uh, clear the congestion. 
uh, you have a, a, a situation of high cardiac index and low coronary artery occlusion and pressure, then probably this is a normal state that what we would like to see, normal cardiac output with low wedge pressure. And finally, you have ca high cardiac index and high pulmonary artery occlusion and pressure, then your patient might benefit from what septic manipulation? Shock. Septic shock or uh, 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 I'm asking about the manipulation. What are you going to do to your patient? He's got high pulmonary artery occlusion and pressure. So really, this is suggestive of uh, a fluid overload, and this patient would benefit uh, from having uh, diuretics. Um, again, this is uh, I, I copied this from the study in 1972. They call it historical data. So I don't know why they suggested vasodilator uh, at this stage. I think uh, diuretics would be the answer in this patient. Uh, complications of uh, PA catheter. Uh, it's like really any CVC. Uh, line, hematoma, injury to adjacent structures, hemothorax, arrhythmias. Uh, really, was something really rare but quite frightening is the knotting uh, of the PA catheter. So that happens when you are you are pushing and you are not following the trace, as I'll show you in the video shortly. All these things related to the maintenance of the PA catheter. So you might end up having PA or mere artery rupture if you inflate the balloon and leave it in inflated or pushing it too hard. Um, especially this would happen in old age uh, patients or if it, there's improper balloon uh, inflation and position or in the context of using anticoagulation, you might end up with pulmonary infarction or thromboembolic uh, event, just like any other line. And there's risk of infection. Usually it gets high and high after the third day. So we rarely exceed five days of PA catheter when we have them in situ. Uh, this is a case of uh, PA catheter nothing, as you can see here, and it took an open chest uh, surgery uh, to deal uh, with, with the situation. Uh, I thought this is a, a great resource, educational resource for those people who would like uh, to, uh, to learn more about the PA catheter. And I'll share with you this maybe one minute uh, video. Uh, please tell me if you don't see the uh, the video because I might need to share the screen. And can you see my uh, video? It's paused. Yeah. No, not seen. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me share uh, the video now because it's from the online. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. So here you can see, you can see, uh, let me just go, yeah. So can you see now the PA uh, catheter just being inserted and the balloon is being inflated? Is it clear that the balloon is being inflated now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, here you, and here you can see the trace now you are in the right atrium. You can see the trace of the right atrium, just like CVP. Then in a minute, it will change to the right ventricle as passes the tricuspid valve. And here you have the, uh, the proper waveform of blood uh, pressure in the right ventricle. And as soon as you get into the PA catheter through the pulmonary uh, valve, then you'll get this step up in the diastolic pressure to suggest that you are now in the pulmonary artery. As you can see, the balloon is quite inflated still. So as it advances to a smaller pulmonary artery branch, then you'll start getting the wedge uh, waveform. So this is, as you can see, the wedge waveform. And if you deflate, then you will get the PA catheter again, the PA uh, waveform, pulmonary artery waveform. Okay. So I'll stop share and share again my presentation. Uh, can you see my presentation? So to conclude, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, but it's 
still video mode. Oh. Uh, now can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. So the conclusion that pulmonary thermodilution has been the gold standard method to assess the cardiac output for half a century. Uh, PA catheter as a tool does not affect the outcome, but what affects the outcome is the, the, the decision based on its data. And as we said yesterday in one of the studies in America, uh, many of the intensivists were, uh, were not able to interpret the PA catheter data appropriately, and that means they ended up doing or taking the wrong decisions in relation to the hemodynamics. Uh, PA catheter is indicated mainly in cases of right ventricular failure and when less invasive techniques are not available or cannot be used. Uh, we'll come to the lead school uh, in a minute. I don't know why this line is here. Now, we'll move on to the uh, more types of uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, assessment. But before that, I have a question. I have uh, these three patients who are hypotensive. And my question to you, can we give them more fluids or not? I'm not sure if any one of you will be uh, brave enough to say I'm going to give any of one of these patients uh, fluids. Uh, I'm not expecting answers unless you are keen to give fluids yeah. to any of these patients. <laughs> um, but I will sure, buy the... People can help us in this kind of cases, sir. Indeed. Well, this is typical chest x that we see a lot in ICU, don't we? And really, in these situations where you need an advanced hemodynamic tool uh, to help you decide whether my patient needs IV fluids or not, or what exactly can I do to improve the situation for my patient? So uh, by the end of the presentation, inshallah, you will have the answers uh, because we are running short of time. So I'll start talking about the transpulmonary thermal dilution devices. We have either the PICO here on the left side or the volume view, or sometimes we call it EV1000. Uh, so what are these devices? Uh, these are devices that allow uh, advanced functional hemodynamic monitoring by utilizing two principles. The first principle is transpulmonary thermodilution, and the second principle is the continuous pulse contour analysis. The beauty of the pulse contour analysis here, it's calibrated to the transpulmonary thermodilution. That's why these devices would be now the, regarded as a gold standard to assist the hemodynamics for the circulation because you are integrating the pulse contour analysis in addition to the thermodilution uh, principles. The measures, that, the measurements that we get from the PICO and EV1000 are two groups, either uh, intermittent measurements, uh, which we get when we do transpulmonary thermodilution, uh, or uh, uh, continuous measurements that we get uh, by continuous pulse contour analysis. And here we will have and the intermittent measurements, we have the cardiac output by injection. So that's why you see I in front of the cardiac output, which tells you this is intermittent measurement or in measurement by, uh, the, uh, inject uh, by injecting uh, the cold saline. Uh, we can get the stroke volume, the global ejection fraction, the global end diastolic index and volume, the extravascular lung water, which is or index, which is one of the safety parameters that we utilize to assess whether our patient uh, can receive more fluids or not. We get also pulmonary vascular permeability index, uh, and I'll tell you about the uh, use of this uh, parameter in a minute. Or in the pulse contour analysis, we get the stroke volume variation, the pulse pressure variation, the pulse contour cardiac output, and here you'll see it as PCCO without the eye in the front of the cardiac output. We get the stroke volume, we get the systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac performance index. We have two main devices in the market, and I wouldn't worry which one I would buy because really studies have shown they are really both equal in their ability to, uh, to give us uh, very close readings. 
what are the device components you will have the central line um, can be in the upper uh, body or it can be uh, in the femoral and then you have the special uh, arterial line with a thermostat uh, lead attached to it and here you inject the cold saline through this uh, sensor and as the saline goes into the circulation, the change in temperature will be sensed here in the femoral uh, area. I've got a short video to share with you, um, but I'm not sure you'll be able to hear the voice. If not, then I'll speak over the video. I'll turn it on. Uh, can, can, uh, can, can you hear the video? Yes, it's it visualized. No, sir. Sound is not audible, sir. Uh, sorry, somebody talking? Sir, the sound is not audible. Oh, the sound is not audible. Okay. So let me talk over the, the video. So basically now we can see that this is the cold saline being injected. And here is the initial thermostat that will detect the temperature of the saline in the syringe. As you inject it, it will go through... and you have to tell the machine how much volume you are injecting. So here you inject as fast as possible. It goes through all the way to the systemic circulation. So this is the, uh, the specialty uh, uh, arterial catheter, which has another sensor to detect the change in the temperature. And this will generate this uh, curve for us here. Right, so this is uh, just a short video to tell you about the components of the device and the principles of it. And really the indications for transparent thermal dilution is really shock states, multi-organ failure state, conflicting therapeutic goals, as we said earlier, if your patient has got ARDS, and subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and intraoperative optimization. So the Two physical two principles that we use, uh, that are used for transparent dilution measurement are either the transparent dilution, well not either both at the same time, and the continuous pulse contour uh, analysis. Uh, so again, we've seen this graph before. This is where you inject; it will go in the mix, the, the cold saline. It will go through uh, to the mixing chamber inside the heart, the pulmonary circulation, and all the way back to the femoral artery catheter where there's a sensor to detect the change in temperature. And this will generate the trans, uh, the thermal dilution curve. And this will, this curve out of it will uh, uh, get uh, all the parameters that we need to know uh, to, to, uh, to get the cardiac output and various uh, uh, measurements. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this other than to say the initial part of the curve reflects the mean transient time, which uh, when we time it by the cardiac output, it will give us the intrathoracic thermal volume. And then the runoff time or the exponential decay time, when you time it by the flow or the cardiac output, then it will give us the pulmonary thermal uh, volume. Uh, just a few words about the shape of the, of the waveform. So this is smooth waveform to indicate normal cardiac output of 5.5. But if there's low cardiac output, then it, the, the flow of fluid will be slower, and that means the cardiac output is slow. It will take more time to get the whole injectate traveling through the circulation. But if the cardiac output is high, then it will take shorter time for the cold saline to reach to the uh, thermostat of the uh, arterial line. If you get this during thermal dilution, then that means improper injection, and that means this reading will not be valid. Right, so here is just schematic uh, representation uh, of what we see or how we get various measurements from the uh, PICO or uh, volume view. 
you inject the cold saline here, it goes to the right atrium, right ventricle, then to the pulmonary uh, vascular vasculature, uh, to the uh, interstitial tissues, then it goes back to the uh, left atrium, and then to the left ventricle, all the way back to the uh, ephemeral uh, arterial catheter. Uh, so this intrathoracic volume will include all this. So cardiac output times the mean transit time will give you all these numbers. And then if you just separate or just take the exponential decay time times the cardiac output, that will give you only the pulmonary thermal uh, volume. So now we have these two. Uh, if you take the pulmonary thermal volume out of from the int total intrathoracic thermal volume, then you will get the global indiastolic volume because now you eliminated this part from the equation, so you end up only with the chambers represented, uh, and that's what we call global indiastolic volume. And this study did show that intrathoracic blood volume equals to the global indiastolic volume times 1.25. Uh, so if we get the intrathoracic blood volume, that means we have excluded the extravascular lung water. So now, if we take uh, the uh, intrathoracic blood volume out from the intrathoracic thermal volume, and forgive me, but this is yani, uh, the, the easiest way, in my opinion, to, to represent this, if you take the intrathoracic blood volume out from total intrathoracic thermal volume, then you will end up only with the extravascular lung water. Okay, so the extravascular lung, lung water is the intrathoracic thermal uh, volume, taking away from it the intrathoracic blood volume. Moving on to the uh, continuous uh, cardiac uh, or pulse contour analysis. You'll be surprised to know that the pulse control analysis has been around for a long time. It was described in 1904, and then Whistling et al. started utilizing it in 1984. So as a principle, it has been there for a long uh, time. The beauty of these devices, it combined the pulse contour analysis with the thermal dilution to calibrate the results of the pulse contour uh, analysis. And as we said, this is really the advantage over the Vigilio, the flow track, or the lid core rapid. Uh, we know the arterial waveform, and we talked about this yesterday, and the different parts uh, of the uh, waveform. Uh, and here, if you like, further analysis of the pulse contour. So the initial part of the upstroke represents contractility. Uh, the distance up to the uh, aortic uh, diacritic notch uh, is really the stroke volume. And here, the initial part of the down slope represents the aortic compliance. And then after the diacritic notch, uh, the runoff uh, waveform represents the vascular uh, tone. So uh, we have, from the pulse contour analysis, we get two important readings, the stroke volume variation as well as the pulse pressure uh, variation and the stroke volume variation is basically the stroke volume maximum, so the area shaded under the care. Uh, this we call it stroke volume max minus the uh, small, uh, the minimum stroke volume. So there is variation. Remember what we talked about yesterday with the breathing? There will be variation in the cardiac output leading to variation in the uh, blood pressure, and that would be reflected here. So if we analyze the area under the curve as stroke volume, so stroke volume max minus stroke volume minimum divided by the mean of the two gives you the stroke volume variation. And uh, uh, if you um, consider the pulse pressure variation, then it's really the, uh, the difference in the pulse pressure between the systolic and diastolic. So the maximum uh, minus the minimum pulse of pressure divided by the mean pulse of pressure will give you the pulse of pressure variation. Uh, in this study, they found a pulse of pressure variation of 13% that predicted the fluid responsiveness with a great sensitivity and specificity and with an area under the care quite high of 0.98. 
the the condition for using pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, as we mentioned earlier, that your patient should be sedated or passively breathing in the ventilator, as well as receiving tidal volume of 8 to 12 milli per kg. And for the stroke volume uh, variation thresholds, there has been many studies uh, with different uh, thresholds. However, the average uh, between the, all these studies is 10%. So probably we can use stroke volume variation of 10% as a cutoff of, to predict uh, fluid responsiveness. We need to keep in mind there is limitation to the stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation that your patient should be mechanically ventilated or even if mechanically ventilated, ideally passively breathing, that the volume should be uh, more than 8 ml per kg. Patient must be in a stable rhythm, ideally should be in sinus rhythm. Uh, and we know that intraabdominal hypertension would affect the variation and might affect uh, the reliability of your results. Um, it cannot be used in open chested procedures and also in patients who are on high frequency oscillation ventilation. Not that we use it a lot these days anyway. Uh, having said all of that, if your patient has got uh, high stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, despite being on small tidal volumes or despite having high intraabdominal pressure, then probably that indicates your patient is significantly hypovolemic and would benefit from uh, or, and would be uh, likely to be fluid responsive. Uh, how reliable the transpulmonary thermal dilution device is compared to the gold standard pulmonary artery catheter. As we can see here, various studies were done uh, more than uh, two decades ago, and they all indicated uh, good correlation uh, in the results. Uh, and this is, again, uh, another study suggesting uh, the same. Right. Uh, limitation for the transpulmonary thermal dilution part. So for the parameters derived by transpulmonary thermal dilution, severe TR might lead to inaccurate estimation of cardiac output, just like what we see in the uh, in the PA catheter, and it cannot be used with ECMO patient. You can use the PICO, the AP1000, with the dialysis patients or CRRT patients, but you cannot use it with ECMO patients because of the high velocity uh, of blood flow with the, uh, with the ECMO. And we already mentioned the limitations of the pulse contour analysis. Uh, some caveats to mention here that there has been difference in patients according to the nature of their disease. So uh, global endoscopic index measurement is different between medical and surgical patients. And younger patients tend to have lower global endoscopic index. Uh, I must say in my hands here in, in Saudi Arabia, I've noticed uh, quite often the Saudi population have lower JEDI compared to the uh, readings that I used to get when I was using these devices uh, in Britain. Uh, until now, I don't have a study. <laughs> we keep saying we need to, do, to run a study to, to have, if you like, a cohort study on uh, measuring the JEDI uh, in the normal population here. Uh, same applies to the external water index. Uh, where it's been found that there's difference between uh, septic patients and surgical patients where lung water index was higher in patients with uh, sepsis. Uh, for example, in septic patients, they found the lung water index uh, to run around 11 compared to the surgical patients where the lung water index used to run around 7.25. So real normal value is uh, 3 to 7. But for surgical patients, aim for lower uh, lung water index compared to the septic patients. Having said that, no matter what, try not to exceed. Uh, we are saying 10, but sometimes we allow it to drift to maximum up to 12 real. The advantages of lung water or extra lung water index measurement can be diagnostic. So it can tell you whether you are dealing uh, with a, a wet lung uh, or not, and whether uh, and can, in that regard, be therapeutic. If we find that your patient's lungs are not wet, despite what you see on the x-ray, then probably you can uh, give them uh, fluids. And also, it's been found to be uh, prognostic. Those patients with lung water index above 21, they had very high mortality rate compared to those who had lower uh, extra lung water 
uh, index. The other use for extravasin lung water, uh, if you are giving your, assessing your patients and you give them uh, a fluid bolus, and you see there's large increment in the cardiac output of incoming the fluids, but there is smaller increment in the extravascular lung water, then that means that your patient is likely to benefit from fluids and can take more fluids, and you can stop when this equation is reversed. So when you give for non-fluid responders, you'll find there is a small increment in the cardiac output uh, upon giving fluids. However, there is a huge increase in the extravascular lung water, and that tells you really this patient shouldn't be receiving uh, intravenous uh, fluids. Uh, a few words about the pulmonary vascular permeability index. It's been found that it's a great tool to differentiate between the hydrostatic pulmonary edema and the inflammatory uh, lung uh, um, infiltrations. Uh, in this study, they had patients with PF ratio less than 300, the chest X-ray digital bilateral infiltrate, the lung water were, was more than 12, and the, the pulmonary vascular permeability index is calculated by dividing the extravascular lung water over the pulmonary blood volume. And they found that a couple of three differentiated these two groups. So patients with pulmonary vascular permeability index of three or less were hydrostatic, uh, pulmonary, had hydrostatic pulmonary edema, whilst most of those patients with PBPI above three had an inflammatory uh, process causing the, uh, uh, causing the lung uh, infiltrates with significant area under the care. So to come back to these patients that we said, uh, can we get more intravenous fluids? So you will see that the first patient here was x-ray discharge on infiltrate, but wasn't too, uh, yeah, you, you might have thought this patient would benefit from fluids. The, he had the highest extravascular lung water, and this patient would benefit really from offloading rather than giving them uh, volume. Uh, this patient here, yes, the lungs looked very wet. However, there is slight increase in the extravascular lung water. Probably I wouldn't give fluids to this patient, or if I'm going to give him fluids, I'll keep an eye on the cardiac output and see if there's improvement in the cardiac output that's outweigh the improvement or the increase in the lung water. For this patient, again, his lungs appeared wet. However, his extravascular lung water was five. And remember, he's a hypotensive patient. And we said always the first step in resuscitating patients is making sure that the tank is full. So this patient in particular would benefit from having uh, intravenous fluids given to them. Uh, these are the screen screenshots from the uh, volume view, as you can see here by Edwards. And the preload parameters uh, would be the stroke volume uh, index. And you see this little eye indicating that this is done by injectate or this result is intermittent. You get the JEDI here as a preload indicator. You get the stroke volume uh, variation here. These parameters on this side are the pulse contour analysis uh, parameters, which will be continuous and they will be changing uh, every 30 seconds uh, or so. Uh, these numbers uh, would change. So again, the stroke volume index would be another uh, pre, um, a preload uh, indicator. For contractility, you get the global ejection fraction. Anything above 25 is normal. The cardiac index, and here you see the I, so this by uh, thermodilution. And then you've got the cardiac index here without the I in front of it. And this reflects the uh, pulse contour analysis readings. And then you get the afterload parameters. And here you get uh, the systemic vascular uh, resistance. Again, you are getting this from the uh, injectate or the intermittent reading, but you can also have it here as part of the pulse contour uh, analysis. This is what we have said about extra lung water index. And you can see this area of the blue. So this is kind of visual representation of the lung water and anything uh, try your best not to exceed 10 or at maximum 12. And then to differentiate between uh, inflammatory lung edema and hydrostatic pulmonary edema, if the PVPI was less than a three, then it's likely that you are dealing with a hydrostatic pulmonary edema that requires uh, diuresis and offloading. 
a few words about Litco and then we will conclude inshallah ta'ala. Uh, lithium dilution cardiac output monitoring. Uh, so here we have uh, uh, the lithium is used as an uh, indicator. Uh, so lithium chloride is injected in the right atrium and then detected in the peripheral artery by a side stream lithium uh, sensor. And here we get cardiac output is calculated from the lithium concentration change over time and provides systemic uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, and SVV. Uh, and here you can see, here you inject the lithium into the, um, the circulation, and then at the radial or the uh, arterial uh, line, there is a side pump that continuously uh, sampling the blood and measuring the change in the concentration of the lithium chloride. So this, again, you are injecting the lithium chloride here, and this is the arterial line where you have this lithium uh, sensor, uh, lithium, uh, yes, side pump, uh, which detects the lithium. And this will give you, uh, once you've done the injection, will give you the dye or uh, dilution of the concentration of the lithium. That will give you uh, both measurements the dilution, initial dilution uh, curve, and to give you continuous uh, uh, readings. Ideally, you should re do the readings every 12 hours or whenever there's significant change in the patient's uh, hemodynamics. These are the data provided uh, by the LITCO, as you would expect. So, in summary, advanced hemodynamic monitoring uh, dissect the hemodynamics into its basic components. Non-invasive tools can be helpful in some patients. It is indicated in worsening or undifferentiated shock in ARDS patients and patients with conflicting therapeutic goals. Uh, and as we said, in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, as well as optimization in major surgeries. Uh, Transformative modulation and lithical devices are as good as the PA catheter. Transformative modulation can be used in both awake and sedated patients. And the, we need to remember the pulse control analysis should only be used in passively breathing patients with tidal volume of 8 ml per kg and in sinus rhythm. Well, this will take any questions. And that concludes our second day of hemodynamic uh, uh, measure, uh, course. <laughs>